Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue our study looking at um, the civil wars uh, in, uh, in Israel and in American history to see how they match up with the civil war within Greece in Daniel chapter 11. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the time that we have again this morning to open your word. We invite your spirit to instruct us, uh, to guide us, to correct us. And we ask for your strength and power in our lives. That um, the conviction that comes from the understanding of your word can empower us uh, to uh, obey you in all things. Uh, we know, Lord, that we are sinners and we need Christ daily and we need a faith and a trust in him. Help our faith to grow and increase and to affect those around us. Be with us now in this study through my spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. It's nice to see everyone. So um, in the study of Daniel chapter 11, dealing with Greece. We know that this is a battle between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. These, but we also have in type uh, the battles between northern and southern Israel. And um, so what we did uh, yesterday is we started looking at uh, 1 Kings chapter 11. So this is basically um, during the reign of Saul and the adversaries that he had. He had three adversaries. Hadad, um, Rezin, and Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam, of course, is going to become the king of northern Israel. And uh, we read a little bit about that. We're going to read more about Jeroboam as we go on. Of course, Rehoboam was the one who inherited the throne with the death of Solomon. Uh, but Rehoboam, as we're going to see in the next chapter, uh, makes some uh, strategic errors. Now, one of the things that we saw yesterday when we looked at this is some symbols that were rather interesting. We're not sure how to apply them or what they mean. Uh, but the first thing is when we deal with Solomon is it's in chapter 11, verse 1, where he's going to be making this uh, league through these marriage with these women. Now, of course, women represent churches. So. At, so in, in the time of Solomon, there's this league with churches. And of course, these churches, they have their religions. Uh, these women have their religions and it turns Solomon's heart away. So, so we noted that symbol, that symbol 11.1 is a symbol of January 11th. And it shows up in the line of the Levites, the last date um, of that structure. And then um, it shows up also in Collins' uh, prediction regarding uh, Biden and Trump. So we're going to have Trump, uh, that, that mirror there, uh, dealing, ending on January 11th, 2023. So we noted that symbol. Uh, then when we looked at um, Uh, the first uh, adversary, Hadad, it was interesting that uh, Hadad has two different uh, Hebrew numbers for his name. He can be Hadad, which is He, Dalit, Dalit. And he can be Adad, which is Aleph, Dalit, Dalit. And when it's He, Dalit, Dalit, that's 1908 is the Hebrew number. And um so it's gonna mention him where is it where it shows the number yeah in verse eleven seventeen he's gonna have this uh Aleph Dalit Dalit. The Hebrew number is gonna be 111. So again we have that symbol, but it's in verse uh 17, and we know uh eleven seventeen is the hundred and eighty-seventh prime number. And it has this unique distinction that if you take 11 times 17, it equals 187. And that 
uh, uh, ties us to the story of Joseph. So, so there are some symbols here. We're not sure particularly what they mean, but it's very interesting that we have these two different spellings of Hadad. Now, um, the other things that's interesting about this is that in Strong's numbers, um, it, uh, it doesn't, um, recognize this spelling. So when we look at this in the Hebrew, um, so, here's, so you're going to see that they have Adad, Aleph, Dalet, Dalet, and yet they have 1908. So Strong's numbers is reflected in the Hebrew here. Um, so these, these numbers here are different. But you can see the spelling is not the same as when we have it uh, in, where is it here, the preceding verse, right over here. You can see it's Pat Dalit Dalit, and that's 1908. So this one should be H111. So when you put it here, they'll say, you know, they have the word here. When you look at the King James Concordance, it's going to say it doesn't occur. But of course it does. It just doesn't occur here in this version um, it, of the numbers, right? But it does when you look at the King James. So that's an interesting anomaly. And so what would an anomaly like this suggest to us? All of these different symbols, the 1117, the 111, what, what is this anomaly uh, directing us to? Would it be directing us to the uh, messages of Revelation 14? Okay, so while we have the three adversaries directs us that way, um, what about just these symbols of 111, 1117, and the two different spellings of Hadad? I mean, if it directs us to Revelation 14, how does that do that? I'm looking at it as, as kind of a, a secondary support to what we were discussing, what we were discussing yesterday. Okay. Dealing with the three adversaries. So how does the symbols, I mean, to me, normally when I see something like this, a discrepancy, like when we had the two different um, uh, Hebrew numbers for the same word uh, dealing with uh, uh, in the story, I think it was the story of Deborah or something like that. Or was it? No, it, I can't remember which story it was in. Um, anyway, we had two different Hebrew numbers for the same word and uh, they were significant. We can't remember what the numbers were, or what the word was. Um but it shows that it's a symbol, that it's some, it draws our attention to it, right? It should be something that we pay Agreed. attention to. Okay, right. Just like when you see something like evenings and mornings in Daniel chapter 8, 14. Um, it, it means it's a symbol, it's significant. Or if we see, um, you know, I will pro prolong to punish you seven for your sins. You see something that's not correct Hebrew grammar. Um, then the question is, why is it written that way? Well, it, it's meant to draw our attention to it. We're time, times and a half. Why would you not just say, you know, three and a half years? You say time, times and a half because you're, you're telling the writer that it's a symbol and that it needs to be understood in some other way. Now here we're dealing not with the actual text, other than that Hadad has two different spellings. We're, we're also looking at the symbols that are not in the original text. That is, they've been added by man later, the chapters and verses, and also uh, the Hebrew numbers. Now, the Hebrew numbers, we could say, well, it's alphabetical and they numbered them alphabetically. But how they divided up the Hebrew words, how Strong's did, is to some degree arbitrary, right? For instance, he can have the same word when it's used as a name or it's used as a word, he actually gives it a different uh, Hebrew number, right? So, and same with the Greek. So, so these numbers, in a sense, are arbitrary, but we say that God has overruled or overseen in his providence these symbols for us to look at today, right? So we have this symbol. We have this 111. And where we primarily place it, uh, 
is having to do with the Levitical chiasm in our history and also the prophetic mirror uh, that Colin had that ended on January the 2023. So, so we think about it. We know it has a connection to July, July 18 because of 1117. Now, um, so this is Haydad. He's going to be the first of the adversaries that are mentioned, right? The, the second one that's mentioned is going to be this resin. Now he is, um, where is he? Uh, so this is the one I know the least about. Um, uh, doesn't give us as much. Um, but he's resin the son of Eliada, which fled from his lord Hadadezer, king of Zobah. And gathered men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them of Zoba, and they went to Damascus and dwelt there and, and reigned in Damascus. So I haven't looked into this yet, uh, but we probably should look into the second adversary. Uh, so he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon beside the mischief that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. And then we have Jeroboam. Of course, he's the most important one because he's going to become the king. Now, yesterday when we were looking at this, we, we neglected to mention some details. So what was the date yesterday? 11-26. So it, it, it was November 26th. And whose birthday is that? Ellen White's. It was Ellen White's birthday. And that was mentioned yesterday. But we failed to mention that, that yesterday was November 26th. So she was born in 1827. And so that would have been, if she is still alive, um, yeah, so that would be 196 years, as Iran points out, from her birth, right? So, so it's just something that we should have noted. But also when we look at Jeroboam, it's in, he's first mentioned here in 1 Kings 11.26. So yesterday, which was 11.26, is the first time we look at him in connection with this study. Now, of course, that's a coincidence, but I think it's in God's providence as well um, that we can see that we're looking at something at the correct time, if that makes sense. So for me, it would just be a symbol that, you know, we're looking at something at the time that God wants us to look at it, which means that it would be relevant to what is happening today either within this movement and the things that we're studying or also in the events that are unfolding around us. Would, would that be um, logical? It would seem to be. Okay. Yeah, just like when on November 24th, we noticed the 2,688 days to April 5th, 2030, last year. And um, so we had noticed that last year and we had counted those days and then um, – and then we notice the 2688 uh, um, uh, document, uh, whatever it was called, um, that has to do with an application for additional extension of time for filing one's taxes in the American uh, tax system. And, of course, that symbol then would symbolize that we've had this time extended for this movement uh, symbolically attached to April 5th, 2030. Um, now, uh, so we have, we have these symbols here. We have this first, the 11th day of the first month. We have 1117. We have 1126. Now, attaching the, this to Ellen White's birthday, what would be the significance there? Symbolic introduction of the spirit of prophecy. Okay. Well, it would definitely re re reference us to the spirit of prophecy to some degree. Right. So there's something about the spirit of prophecy that we need to pay attention to. Um, now, we also know 196 is four times 49 or seven times seven times four. Right. Um, so it's something that we should take note of um, regarding is it four times seven, four times seven times seven. Yeah. 
or seven times two times two times seven, however you want to break it up. Seven times seven times two times two is 196. Right. So anyway, there's, there's some symbols there, um, just that we're looking at Jeroboam on the 196th birthday of Ellen White. Now we know, of course, her birthday in 18, uh, 27 has all the digits of 1872, July 18, 2020. Um, so it ties us to that. So, I mean, this is kind of esoteric stuff. It's something that, you know, we understand that the average person would just think we're talking gobbledygook. Um, but we understand that these symbols help guide us in understanding uh, where we are at in putting together these lines. Now, we know also we talked about um, the Thanksgiving Day prediction. So that's something we're going to look at, um, why that prediction was made, what I think it meant regarding our inability to predict events in advance, and the fact that this was censored by the movement at the time, and, and even after, even on November 10th, 2019, after three meetings in which this was presented and Jeff said, it's logical, it's consistent with what we believe, we believed it to be truth, those uh, presentations were never published uh, by FFA. They never put online. I wasn't even allowed to have a copy of them. So, <clears throat> so you know, these types of things say that there's something that we need to understand in this movement to help us sort through what's happening presently within the movement. That's, that's the way that I would look at this. So it, it tells us something much more internally rather than externally. So when we look at Jeroboam, uh, we know we talked about how there is um, this prophet Ahijah who's going to come and he's a Shilonite. What does that mean? What's a Shilonite? Does so, that mean he comes from Shiloh? He comes from Shiloh, right? So that, that's all that means. So, okay. So he, he's a Shilonite. He comes from Shiloh. And Shiloh uh, means a place of rest. Um, so he's the Shilonite. Okay. And, and the Hebrew number there is 7888, which is interesting just because of the triple eights. And, um, and seven, right? So, some interesting symbols there. Now, the, the name is, he is a hija. So we know that this means, uh, brother of Jehovah. Right? Now, I mean, we run into him here. We don't really know much about him other than he's a Shilonite. Okay. Um, but he's going to, um, so it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment and they too were alone in the field. And it says, and Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. So, again, in Hebrew, it's hard to tell who's being referred to. Um, so, who is the garment on who's clad with the new garment? Is Jeroboam clad with the new garment or is Ahijah? Jeroboam, ain't it? Okay, how, how would we prove this? Okay, so we're, we're looking at this here. So it says it came to pass, so just read it again. It came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shalonite, found him in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. So it seemed to me that uh, he's taking the garment off of it is this word uh, caught would be sort of the, the key here. That means to seize or to capture, right? So it'd be unlikely that he's wearing the new garment. So 
He's taking this garment off of Jeroboam. So Jeroboam has a new garment on. Right. Um, and he said to Jeroboam, take the 10 pieces for thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give 10 tribes to thee. Now, of course, one of the things it makes more sense him taking the garment off of Jeroboam with the symbol being attached to it. Right. And we know garment can represent character. But here we also have uh, attached to this idea of this new garment. Um, this that this word new Kodesh or, or Kadash Kadash. Um, if we just look at a different vowel pointing, uh, would refer to the moon or the new moon, right? So, so we're saying that that there's a symbol here uh, addressing uh, time. That is, it's addressing the new moon and the sky, right? So that's the way that I'm interpreting this. This new, we would see in Hebrew a pun, a place placed upon the word kodesh. So this is a garment like a new time. So it's representing, sim- symbolizing a, a dispensation. Let's put it that way. So a change is occurring. And, and we could kind of take that even just with new garment itself in English. Um, so this is a time in which the kingdom is going to be divided. Now, it says he, he rends it or pieces it into 12 pieces. Right, because there's the same basic word, 7167 being used as a verb, 7168 being used as a noun, right? But he's going to give 10 pieces to Jeroboam, and he says that one, right, in verse 32, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake. So he gives him 10 pieces, but he talks about one. That seems kind of odd because... That's 11 pieces. And then, uh, so Dwight used, made a suggestion that this has something to do with, um, the pieces, the garment. Yeah, but they had to do with, um, um, these, uh, seceding states. Yeah. So this, yeah. So in the civil war, you have the succession of states. So that's the, so the tribes represent the states. Now, if we think about it, there's, you know, there's 13 states that when the United States begins, right, as a symbol. So the 13 uh, has to do with those 13 colonies that make up the right. United States. And then uh, we also have during the Civil War, there's going to be 11 states that succeed and then there's two other states so it ends up being 13 as well okay succeed not succeed okay succeed yeah okay and it was it's interesting because at the time of the civil war there were 33 states in the union okay one third of the states 11 of them seceded because they wanted to retain the rights to being slaveholding states. Yeah. There would have been 13, but two states were partially under control of the Confederacy, partially under control of the Union. Yeah, so they're, they're divided to some degree. Correct. Yeah, so a shadow government. So you have the actual government is still there, but then you have this other shadow government. To go Correct. Okay. okay, so so it's kind of interesting that we can see that this this these symbols are there. Now, when it comes to Israel, there is actually 13 uh, tribes. If we take Joseph being divided into uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, making 13, but the Levites are not reckoned among the tribes, right? They, they're not part of the count. So they have uh, cities in all of the different territories when they possess the land. So, uh, and we saw that also that symbol when it dealt with 273. Um, that's in um, 
Numbers chapter uh, three, where you're going to have the they count the the number of the firstborn and then all of the the children of of the Levites, right? And they have this difference in number um, that's 273, and they have to get redeemed. And if you take the number, um, and uh, can't remember the number right now. Uh, but anyway, if you if you divide it, you get 1260 in there as a symbol. So if you take that number and you, uh, uh, if you divide it, so uh, yeah, it's 105 uh, shekels. So yeah, so you get 1365 shekels altogether. So if you take 1365 and you divide it by 13, you get the symbol 105, which is the 10th day of the fifth month. So, so there was all these symbols attached to, um, to that story of the Levites and, um, and to the 13 tribes. So, so this 13 is still kind of here, though we also have an 11 here, right? So I think it's rather interesting. Now, we're going to equate this uh, battle between the North and the South as more like the Revolutionary War in the sense that uh, it, it parallels that history a little bit more. And we'll see that when we start drawing this on a line where the Civil War in, in the 1860s is going to parallel more uh, what happens in 742 B.C. But it also operates in a mirror-like fashion. That is, the north represents the south and the south represents the north. And we know that, remember, in our prophetic mirror, um, so I'm just going to show you the prophetic mirror. So just just simple. We're all familiar with this. So you're going to have this seven times prophetic mirror. And you're going to see over here you have a civil war where the north is confederate versus the, the south. Uh, but in the Civil War in 1863, the South is Confederate, right? So you, in both places you have this Confederacy, um, but in 1863 it's going to be the South, okay, rather than the North. So we already understand this mirror relationship between these civil war civil wars. So so this these civil wars we have connected. What we hadn't connected fully before was what happens when uh, the United Kingdom of Israel is divided into north and south. We hadn't connected that really. And we we hadn't really put in here the Revolutionary War, right? We just had the Civil War. And then also connecting it to our history. So all of those things uh, need to be done. Um so, um, so we're going to have uh, this prophecy regarding Jeroboam, right? I'm just going to read over this here quickly. Uh, verse, I'll start here. Uh, now, the reason that it happens is because of their false worship, right? And 11, verse 34, how be it, I will not take the whole kingdom, out of his hand, but will make him prince all the days of his life for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes, referring to Rehoboam. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand. Right. So this is going to be Solomon. And he's going to take it out of his son's hand. And I will give it unto the even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe. So that's going to be Rehoboam. That David, my servant, may have a light all the way before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. Now, it's interesting here, um, we have this word chosen. So we know that it's in 977 BC that this is going to occur, that Solomon is going to die. Um, and now we have this, this word chosen. Now we could say, well, you know, it just happens to be there. Um, but if we look at the context of this, this is actually telling us about when uh, Rehoboam, 
is going to be given the city of Jerusalem, right? So this happens in 977. And this word chosen, uh, it's it, a bak, bakar. So I'll just look at it here. It means to choose, elect, or decide for. And so what would be the significance of having this word chosen regarding Jerusalem and placing it there in 977? Is unless we're, you know, just reading into it. So the city of Jerusalem is still chosen. God's going to put his name there. I think it's interesting that the word uh, put, I've chosen me to put, uh, the Hebrew number is 7760. And it just reminds me of the number 776, which is in reference to um, to the land of Israel, right? So I believe that's the number. So anyway, it's just, but also, you know, you could take this um, and put it on end and you're going to get 977 as well. If you just take the six and turn it over and then read it backwards, whether that's significant or not, but uh, we have the symbol of 977 connected with Jerusalem. Okay. And then um, I will take thee and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth and shall be a king over Israel. And it shall be if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee and wilt walk in my ways and do that is right in my sight and keep to keep my statutes and my commandments as David, my servant did, that I will be with thee and build thee a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for his, for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Um, so now is Jeroboam going to keep this covenant? So God makes a covenant with him. Is Jeroboam going to keep it? Is he going to have a, a, a dynasty that lasts like David's dynasty? No, right? So he's going to be disobedient. And you're going to see that right away. And Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. So Solomon finds out about this. And Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now, just a chronological note. So the Shishak is undoubtedly Shosh, Shoshank, the first. And if you look up on Wikipedia, the dates for Shoshank, they're going to have him start roughly about um, 958 or something like that. Now, why do you think they place Shoshank later than, than this history, because this has to be before 977. So why do they place uh, this Egyptian pharaoh? Why do they place him differently than we do? Does anybody, can anybody guess why they do that? How do they derive his date of when he is the pharaoh? Okay. Think about, you know, some things we've learned about uh, uh, secular archaeology. How did they date a artifact? How do they date an artifact? Carbon dating. Well, not really. Uh, they date it based upon the sediment they find it in. But how do they date the sentiment, sediment that they find an artifact in? They base it upon the artifacts they find in it. They use a type of circular reasoning, right? The same thing happens here with Shawshank. They used to date Shawshank later, or earlier, I guess it would be, right? So like 980 BC. But then when Edwin Thiel corrected the chronology of the kings of Judah, they necessarily had to move him later, right? So, so some people will look at this and say, well, you have Seven nine nine seventy seven BC for um, you know the death of Solomon, and he's going to die in the time when Shishak or Shashank the first is the pharaoh of Egypt, and so your chronology must be wrong. 
right? That's that's how they would look at it. They say, well, how do you get that? But but the simple fact is that that chronology is derived from that connection with how they perceive the biblical chronology to begin with. Now, they do use carbon dating, but carbon dating um, has a range, right? And how you interpret a carbon date a lot of times depends upon what you already think. So it's not as clear cut as that. Um, so we would put Shawshank, he would actually begin in 980 BC. And this, when uh, Jeroboam flees to Shishak or Shawshank, uh, this is going to be probably about um, the year after that. So about 789, two years before uh, Solomon's death. So, so it's just a little note for people who are sometimes uh, questioning the biblical chronology that we have. Now, another thing I want to point out, somebody had commented on uh, yesterday's study um, asking about the Septuagint and the Meseret, Meseretic uh, chronology of, of Genesis. And, of course, you know, it's a person who's been following these messages, because you will find all kinds of information on the Internet uh, saying that the Septuagint chronology is the correct chronology. Uh, but when they're doing that, um, they're making a lot of assumptions. But as Seventh-day Adventists, there's no way that we can accept the Septuagint chronology of Genesis, which adds a thousand and some more years uh, to the chronology of the Bible. But the simple fact that Ellen White doesn't accept it. And so, but there's lots of other reasons. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that when it comes to the chronology, we have had all of these structures that uh, Stephen has discovered um, by looking at the chronology that uh, has come from uh, the study that we did on figuring out how the biblical chronology works. And so he would look at these spans of time. And um, so I'm just going to show you this one here that he posted on the Unity chat. Right. So if you look at this, uh, this structure, all of this structure is dependent upon our understanding of chronology. If you got rid of our understanding of the chronology, these things wouldn't work. And um, so we have, uh, for instance, here, um, uh, from Methuselah being born to Lamech being born, 187 years, and then 777 years to Lamech dying, right? And, and so Stephen has done this before, where he took from Artaxerxes' decree to the Sunday Law of Constantine. This was discovered on December 25th, 2021. And then there's 187 years to the daily being taken away. So you can see this mirror. And then there's 1938 years in between when Lamech dies and Artaxerxes' decree. And Isaac is born... Um, in 1938 uh, uh, BC, right? So you can see we got this this date here, and that's uh, 457 years after Lamech dies. So it's very interesting. And then, so you can see that there's also 1938 years between these two dates, and we got this 969 years, 969 years here. That's how many years Methuselah lived. And then the center of this is the weaning of Isaac. So you've got 1,933 years here and here. So if we have our biblical chronology, which is all dependent upon our understanding of all of this chronology, it's all a unit, it's all together, we have these structures that exist, but they don't exist if our chronology is incorrect. Right? So... So it's a remarkable artifact of our chronology. So it's just just in a, a side note dealing with some of these chronological issues. <clears throat> okay, so we know that uh, Solomon reigns for 40 years, as does David, and as does Saul. So that 120 years 
divided into 40, 40, 40 is significant. And then Solomon's going to die and Rehoboam, his son, is going to be the king of Israel. Okay, so in uh, 1 Kings 12, verse 1, it says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Job, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all his the congregation of Israel came, and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. Now, remember, um, when, when Saul was made king, of course, the warning was that this was going to happen. So under Saul, David, and Solomon, uh, there's this oppression, and that's one of the reasons the people are not keeping the sabbatical rest of the land. They're not observing these things uh, for the very simple fact that um, they're having a hard time of it. And so, uh, of course, that's going to make it worse, but that's human nature. Um, so uh, Rehoboam is uh, the king and Jeroboam and the congregation of Israel. So that is the people of Israel are coming to Shechem where Rehoboam is being made king. Now, uh, why Shechem? What's the significance of Shechem? We studied this quite a bit. So when we see Shechem, what is it? It's where the mounts of blessing and cursing are. Right. Gerizim and Ebal. Yeah, Gerizim and Ebal there, and it's in the valley there. Um, so, um, and, and we also saw that uh, the first king before Saul, uh, which was, um, I can't think of his name, Abimelech, right? Uh, he's going to be made king there. Right. Of course, he's he's not king over all Israel or anything, uh, but he's going to try to become king. And that's going to be in Shechem. So this is where you're going to become king at that time in Shechem. Now. Um, and uh, he said, that is Rehoboam unto them, depart yet for three days. And come again to me and the people departed. So he's going to have this three days consultation and King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived and said how do ye advise that I may answer this people and they spake unto him saying if thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day and will serve them and answer them and speak good words to them then they will be thy servants forever but he forsook the counsel of the old men which had give, which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. And he said unto them, what counsel give ye that we may answer? This people who have spoken to me, saying, make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, thy father made our yoke heavy, but thou may but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now whereas my father did laid you with heavy yoke, a heavy yoke, and I will add to your yoke. Um, my father has chised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore, the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite, 
unto Jeroboam, the son of Medad. Okay. So, I mean, there's lots of lessons in this story. And so we have Rehoboam's folly. So what do we see here in this story that's of interest to us? What about the symbol of the three days? What does that mean to this movement presently? Similar to the three days of the two witnesses lying dead in the streets. Okay. Well, I, we generally apply this in, in the understanding of our lines to, uh, the story of Ezra chapter three, chapter seven to ten. So you have the three days at the river Ahava, the three days once they get to Jerusalem that they bring the gold and silver to the temple. And you have the three days call to Jerusalem for repentance that's going to end on the 20th day of the ninth month. And so we know the 20th day of the ninth month in our line is December 25th, uh, 2021, right? Correct. So, so we had that symbol there. Yeah. So we also have from July 18th to Midnight, a symbol of three days. That's the prediction before midnight. Right. So, so we know that Samuel Snow's, uh, last letter is going to be published on July 18th, three days before midnight. And we have the three days in, uh, the story of Joseph with the interpretation of the dreams of the butler and baker, which have been seen as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And so we would have to say here the three days are connected with this in some way. Right? So that's where we can connect it. That's what I would do with the three days here. Um, so the three days we, we have representing, to some degree, they represent the three uh, dates, primary dates that are all Sabbaths. Uh, November 9th, 2019 is the Sabbath. Uh, July 18th, 2020 is the Sabbath. And December 25th, 2021 is the Sabbath. And we recognize those as representing three days. We also had the three days in connection with the December 6th, 2020 declaration. Uh, There's three days attached there. Um, and uh, with... Um, I'm just remembering it correctly. And we remember that that declaration was issued on the 20th day of the ninth month in 2020. So that they could not have chosen a better day symbolically to issue this declaration. It was the 12th month, the sixth day, a symbol of 126 in 2020. So 126 times 20, of course, is 2520. And they issued it on the 20th day of the ninth month, one biblical year to the day prior to December 25th, 2021. Right. So. So if we're going to look at these three days and we look at the issue that's going on here, the issue, what 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 is being decided here? In this period of three days, can we see any correlation between what's happening there and what's happened in this movement? Like on a basic level, what is this about? On a basic level, what is the three days about? What is this story about? Isn't it about the movement itself? Okay, so it's about the movement and it's about the leadership of the movement. Which direction you're going to go. Right? Because, because Rehoboam, he's, you know, he's the legitimate king, right? But he's going to make an error. Correct. Okay. It's, it's Rehoboam's folly. Is there any connection at all? And, and, Obviously, there's some subjective interpretation of how to understand this. Um, but we can see that the movement becomes split or divided um, in our history. 
So this could be um, this could be applied different places. Where I generally had applied this had to do with the split with Parminder and and so forth, right? And and, and why was that? Why did I why would I associate this with what happened with Parminder? Just on on the surface of understanding the story, who went with Parminder? The majority of those that were within the movement. Okay. Um, okay. So, so we're going to see this majority move, right? Now, as far as Rehoboam and Jeroboam, Rehoboam has counsel. And the counsel he's going to listen to is the counsel of the young men, right? So, so there's some ways in which we look at the story to decide what it means as far as the movement. Is it, isn't that clear cut? I mean, there's different ways people could interpret it. Parminder's group could interpret it uh, a certain way. But Parminder's group followed the young men, right? So, so I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation that you can take this story and say, you know, this is how, it, how we would understand it. But as far as the old men, the old men are going to be the people that continue following the truth but but it doesn't really show these two groups it's not really connected with that it just has to do with the consultation so so there is something going on within the movement uh, that's represented by the old man and the young but right? the, the council of the young is this progressive hip and happening you know woke attitude Right. So how that how that how that plays into this understanding is that's how I originally had understood it. The movement makes this error of listening to the counsel of the young man. But I'm not sure if that's based the best way to interpret this overall, especially because of the symbols attached. Now, where Jeff attached this to. Remember 977, he looked at, at, um, uh, the symbols there attached to, uh, September of, of 2019, September 7th, 2019, right? So he had attached it there. And so that's kind of how we were interpreting this story, this split that happens in 977. Okay. But maybe there's something more because we have attached to it this three days which would bring us to December 20, uh, or not December, December 6th, 2020. Now, so I think it's, it's a little more involved in that what we saw happen with Parminder's group. When we get to December 6th, the declaration is basically stating the same arguments that Parminder said, right? So we could say, I mean, it doesn't happen all at once. There's first there's Parminder's group that leaves, and and there's this group that appears to stay, but ultimately they're really of the same sentiment, right? They're going to follow with the same arguments of Parminder, and then we have a group that stays after December sixth, and even though some people take this as offensive, but I'm saying that they're still using Parminder's arguments in their predictions. That is, they're using ideas or methodologies or understanding of the lines that Parminder had introduced, and they just were so ingrained within uh, the thinking of the movement that we start to make the same mistakes that Parminder made, that, that they're, uh, that we're, you know, it, to me, it's, there's just this lack of consistency and understanding how these lines work and and what we are to be doing so we end up having the same attitude as far as how we deal with people in this movement that differ with us uh, we have the same attitude about uh, uh you know how we're interpreting things or same uh, methodology of interpretation we haven't applied consistently miller's rules and the line upon line and so we keep making mistakes. And so the movement continues to make the same mistakes that it's made. And we can see here with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, both of them 
go off, right? That is, neither of them are going to be doing God's will. Uh, now, northern Israel is going to be worse than, than Judah. But, but still, nonetheless, both are affected by these false, false worship. So I'm just saying that this three days ties us to the, this December uh, 6, 2020 declaration. But not just to that. We also have applied the three days um, between. So if we, we look at this, this 20th day of the ninth month, we have it. We have it in December 6th, but we also have it on December 25th, 2021, right? So we can see on December 25th, 2021, that the movement in first not wanting to meet together, you know, on the last date of our 777 structure to work together, all the various groups, even though an appeal was made uh, to the various groups that we should, we should have a study together. So that everyone's included and, and try to understand, uh, where we are in our lines. Um, instead that was rejected and Colin is going to present his prediction regarding Trump on that day. But Stephen also figures out the 777 years from 457 to 321. So there's a lot of things that happen on that date, but that's also the 20th day of the ninth month. So. So that symbol is attached there. Um, and then we have uh, from the 20th day of the ninth month, um, we can count to April 5th, 2030. So it's, there's different ways in which we do it. I'm not going to go into the details there, but there's many witnesses that connect um, that history to April 5th, 2030. So again, April 5th, 2030 keeps showing up. So any more thoughts on that? So those are my thoughts. And when we look at 12 verse 15, wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people for the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, uh, when you look at a, a text like this, that that God was behind it. I mean, God obviously would rather not that the kingdom be divided, that, you know, his people are worshiping false gods and so forth. But God has laid out a course of what was going to happen to correct his people and what he wanted to have to correct his people is this movement to be divided. Right. Can we agree with that? That this was a, a result of our sin and that God had to have things happen this way to correct us. Agreed. Okay. So now if we're going to relate this, of course, to the civil wars, I mean, this is fairly deep. It's fairly connected. We have stuff that's internal within this movement that relates to us today that we can see. Um, but we know also uh, that this is relating to, uh, What's going to happen later in the United States in breaking off from Great Britain? Um, and then we're going to see uh, the civil war in the United States between the North and the South having symbolic uh, significance prophetically. It's part of God's providence. And then the civil war that's occurring in the United States as of what today uh, that's going to get worse. Right. So we know that there's going to be a civil war according to the spirit of prophecy. So right now we're sort of in a cold civil war, but it still exists. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king saying, what portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse to your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. And King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones, that he died. Um, therefore, Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. So this guy goes to collect tribute, and he's stoned. Rehoboam flees. 
and to Jerusalem. Um, and it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 104,000 chosen men, which were warriors to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So notice here, um, even though it says he just has Judah, he's also going to have the tribe of Benjamin. And you're going to get uh, 180,000 men altogether to go and fight against Israel. Um, now, uh, this occurs in Second King or First Kings 12:21. Is there any significance here in having this verse attached to this? So we know 12 times 21 is 252, right? So just to remind you why we're talking about this. Because remember, we have 252 attached to the December 6, 2020 declaration as well, right? Would we call that a battle? People following what I'm saying here? Any comments on it? Very likely it's a battle. Okay. So, so, so it's a battle that, that's going on within this movement. And that battle's still continuing, right? Um, we get, can't, we don't just place it at December uh, 6, 2020. It's, it's been continuing in this movement ever since then. Um, I mean, we could say, you know, since July 18, 2020, with that disappointment and Jeff stepping out, um, you know, the movement sort of is in disarray. And we have different voices with different ideas happening. December 6, 2020 separates out FFA itself from what's happening uh, with the rest of the movement. But the rest of the movement is not really united. Um, and and it, it shows in, and in the development in 2021 what ends up happening to the movement by the time we get to December 25th, 2021, we definitely have the deep divisions within the movement. So, so we can see that this is, uh, you know, this kingdom being divided uh, represents this movement being divided. Okay. <clears throat> so when, um, says, uh, but the word of God came unto Shema, Shemamiah, Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken, therefore, to the word of the Lord. And return to depart according to the word of the Lord. So they're going to listen to God in this instant. And that is not to fight. Right. Which we can say is from God. This is part of the message that has been given to this movement. Is that we are not to fight against each other. We're not to be making each other our enemies. Okay. Then Jeroboam built Shechem, the Mount of Ephraim, in the Mount of Ephraim, and dwelt therein, and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is, too, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So we're going to have these two golden calves. One in, he places in Bethel, the other he puts in Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. So he's not going to be using Levites. 
And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So when it says like unto the feast that is in Judah, we would assume that this is uh, like unto the day of atonement. Right? Because it's in the fall. And he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he has devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So um, we're going to, we don't have too much time, about 15 minutes. Now, when we look at uh, the chiasm that happens in connection with um, the story of Ezra. So we have how many chiasms in the story of Ezra 7, 7 to 10? What are the chiasms that we have there? We have these periods of three days, right? And they create some chiasms. And what are the chiasms? What dates do they point to? Anyone? Would you repeat your question, please? So in the story of Ezra, 7 to 10, we're going to have some chiasms, just like we have in 1844. We have chiasms in those letters. You know, we have the chiasm with July 21st as the center. Uh, But what chiasms do we have in the story of Ezra that we know of? Days of dedication, days of repentance. Okay, just we have a chiasm. So when we go from the three days at the River Ahava to the that they leave on the 12th day of the first month and they come to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. It's a period of um, 107 days, right? Right. And and the center date is the sixth day of the third month. So you have Pentecost as the center, right? All right. Okay. And then you also have... Um, the Day of Atonement is the center when you go from the three days, the center of those three days from the first day of the fifth month to the 20th day of the ninth month is the 10th day of the seventh month. You have these two uh, chiasms that mark uh, Pentecost, which is when Christ begins his uh, ministry in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary in 31 AD and the 10th day of the seventh month pointing to 1844 when Christ uh, closes his work on the first in the first compartment and moves to the most holy place, right? So in 457 BC we have this natural structure. Um, it doesn't it doesn't require a great deal of understanding of chronology or anything. It's just you need to know how to count. Uh, that you can see that you're going to have these Pentecost in the Day of Atonement as the center here. Okay. And then you're going to have um, see if we can find the other one. So there, there is another chiasm that occurs, but we don't generally refer to. It. I just got to find it here. Okay, so one of the significant dates in Millerite history, of course, is the midnight cry, August fifteenth, right? That's a symbol of the fifteenth day of the eighth month. Correct. So we can see that there's this correlation between this counterfeit uh, Day of Atonement in 977 BC to this August 15th date. That is, there's something that is true that's from God, and it's it's counterfeited by this 15th day of the eighth month. Okay. So I'm just going to find this here. So um, I know I have a chart with it, but I just don't know where it is. Lots of different charts. Okay. I don't know if I got rid of that one.
Oh, here, this one has it. Um, I didn't notice it. So, so here we have 457 BC. Now, one thing to note is that between the 10th day of the seventh month, you can see here, oops, the 10th day of the seventh month in 457 and the 20th day of the ninth month, what's in the center? One five eight. Yeah, so it, so there's another symbol. It's the 15th day of the eighth month happens to be halfway between the 10th day of the seventh month and the 20th day of the ninth month. So this is also the date that Jeroboam uses to create this counterfeit day of atonement, right? So he's, he's going to choose the 15th day of the eighth month. So it becomes a symbol in 977 BC. But here, here again, you have a people entering into a league with a false leader. Right. Now we know on the 15th day of the eighth month, August 15th, 1844, that this is, is something from God, right? This is the Correct. midnight. Okay. But you can see how there's a counterfeit of that, right? So we can say what happens in 977 BC is a counterfeit midnight cry. Now we also know in Ezekiel, when he's going to lie on his left side, he's going to begin on July 21st. Right. So he's going to begin on July 21st, 592 BC, and he's going to finish on uh, the 10th day of the fifth month, last day in 591 BC. And then he's going to begin lying on his right side on August uh, 15th for 40 days. Right. So he's going to have there the symbols of Midnight and the Midnight Cry in in his line on his left and his right side. So Midnight and the Midnight Cry, they exist in these structures, as well as the Day of Atonement and other dates. Um, <clears throat> so Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So he's a king. He's going to be acting as a priest. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar, which he had made in Bethel, the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. incense. So he's going to be doing this on this counterfeit date. Right. And then in 13, behold, there came a man of God out of Ju Judah, excuse me, Judah, by the word of the Lord unto Bethel and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So he's going to be offering on the 15th day of the eighth month. So if you just read uh, chapter 13, you wouldn't know it's on the 15th day of the eighth month. You have to read the end of the preceding chapter. And he cried against the altar. That is this prophet um, that came to him, this man of God. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, well, altar, altar. So again, you have this doubling, a symbol of the midnight cry. Thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. Upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when the king Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so that he could not pull it again to him. And the altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Right. So you have uh, the sign, a moped, in the sense of something conspicuous, a miracle, by implication, a token or omen. Right. So um, 
Now, it's kind of interesting um, when we look at this word that's chosen as a sign. So when he says altar, altar, what is the uh, Hebrew number for altar? It's 4196, right? So we have this word, uh, mizbech. Um, it means altar. It uh, comes from zabak to slaughter an animal, right? Okay, so he's going to double this. Now, there's no linguistic connection between uh, altar and um, uh, the word sign. 419-4159, but um, uh, what was there about this? So this is the word mofet. Um, yafa, to be bright. Okay, so <clears throat> so I'm going to just leave that for now. So according to the sign, so so this altar... So let's just look at it this way. This altar, this is a doubling. So, so the altar is going to be rent in two, right? In other word, uh, rend, not necessarily in two. It just means literally or figuratively revile, paint the eyes as if enlarging, cut out, rend. Uh, so tear. And the ashes, 1880, deshing, uh, are poured out from the altar. Right, so you got this altar four one nine six. Now, so what is the sign specifically? Because it says that there is a sign according to the sign. So what is the sign? He gave a sign the same day. The altar shall be rent. What is this sign representing? Um, something conspicuous. token or an omen because when is this going to be fulfilled like it talks about this altar so we know when we go to second kings 23 right because this is going to be about josiah and in second kings 23 um starting at verse uh which verse is it 23 verse, yeah, starting at verse uh, 15, I believe it is. Okay, um, and so this here, uh, 23 verse 15 says, Moreover, the altar that was in Bethel and the high place of which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place, he break down and burnt, burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. So he is going to break down this altar. Right? He's going to tear down and break it down. And Josiah turned himself and spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar. And polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these words. And then he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. And all the houses, also the high places and cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made, they provoke the Lord God to anger. So anyway, um, now this occurs when? Now, if you read in Second Kings, uh, you would assume that this is going to occur. Um, where is this? At the same time that he has the Passover, right? Right, and that's going to be in... Uh, 622 BC, the 18th year of the King Josiah. But when does this occur? When does this um, prophecy of Josiah, when is it fulfilled? 
Why, why do we say it's not in the 18th year? Anybody know? Might not have dealt with this. So, so it's going to be in 627 BC. And why do we place it there? Does anybody know? Okay. So when we go to, um, second chronicles, I think it's 34. Um, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign and he reigned in Jerusalem one in 30 years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David, his father and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God of David, his father. And in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and carve the images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on the high above them. He cut down in the groves and carved images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed him to them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh, of Ephraim and Simeon, even until Naphtali with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan the son of, this is when he's going to have the Passover in Jerusalem in the 18th year. So when does he begin this work of breaking down these altars? He's going to begin it in his 12th year. And we're saying that it's actually in his 13th year uh, because he's going to first start in Judah. And then he's going to work his way north. And Bethel is in the south. So we're saying that it's going to be in his 13th year at the time that Jeremiah begins his ministry that, that the prophecy of Josiah is fulfilled. So that's kind of an aside, but it's something that um, we need to know. So we're going to close here now. Uh, any any final comments? I mean, we we had a little bit of a diversion there, but we're going to keep going back uh, to this story um, of this civil war and the significance of it uh, tomorrow. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for a blessing upon what we have studied. I pray that you be with each person studying these things and help us to clearly understand them. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.